All right, tonight I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach to you about Peter. Anybody heard about Peter before? A couple people, yeah. Peter's pretty important in the Bible. He, um, he's one of Jesus' disciples. Of course, Jesus had 12 disciples. Peter was one of them. And it seemed like Peter's mouth always got him in trouble a lot. Um, one time Peter told Jesus, Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? And by way of the Holy Spirit, Peter knew the answer. He said, You're the Son of God. You're, you're the Christ. And Jesus looks at him and he said, Peter, that's amazing. That's revelation. You didn't know that on your own. That's the Holy Spirit teaching you. Jesus applauded Peter and he... Um, he was proud of him, and he said, Peter, because of this revelation, I'm going to call you the rock. That's actually how his name got changed from Simon to Peter, or Simon Peter. Okay, so he went through a transformation name change even in that moment. Well, I don't know how long chronologically, but sometime after that, <laughs> Jesus is telling his disciples, um, I'm going to have to go to the cross. I'm going to die. You know, they're going to kill me. And, but this has to be done for the better of, of the world. Peter looks at Jesus and he says, forbid it not. He said, no, you're not going to do that, Jesus. I'm not going to let you do that. You can't do that. And Jesus looks at Peter, and <laughs> the same person he had just applauded. He looks at Peter and he says, I rebuke you, Satan. He calls Peter Satan to his face. I mean, that's like a, you know, that's, that's a spectrum. Peter was here with Jesus, and then it, I'm sure that day he felt like he was down here in Jesus' category. However, Jesus said that because it wasn't Peter. It was Peter's emotions. It was, it was the flesh side of Peter saying to Jesus, No, you can't do that. I'm not, no. But Jesus knew that he had to do it, even though his own flesh didn't want to. So Peter was responding from his flesh. And I think many of us get in that, that battle between spirit and flesh and which one we allow to take first place. And um, that's when, you know, that you almost see the picture in commercials, you know, good angel, bad angel. You know, that's, that's the internal war between the spirit of God that's in you and your flesh. I'll teach on that another time. And I have some teachings on that. If you want them, just reach out to me. I've taught on it several times. Um, I have an in-depth teaching on that from probably a couple months after I came that we can pull up if you want to know more about the battle between the spirit and the flesh. But, but you can see where Peter's relationship with Jesus, it was at points really good and then at points really low. Just by those two quick stories. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to another point in scripture where Peter's relationship with Jesus was on a roller coaster all right so it's in John 18 and I if you have your Bible app you can pull it out if you don't want to it's fine I don't have it on the screen tonight I'll try to do better at that I'm just not good at uh, doing powerpoints and all that stuff so you can just listen along it's not going to be a lot of reading <clears throat> tonight John 18 this is while Jesus is going to the cross They've captured Jesus. They're taking him to be crucified. Meanwhile, Peter was standing in the courtyard by the fire. So here's Peter hanging out, maybe around a, a, a brush fire, a campfire, whatever, in the city, in the courtyard. <clears throat> and one of the guards, army guards, standing there said to Peter, Aren't you one of his disciples talking about Jesus? I know you are. And then Peter swore. Peter cussed. What? Disciple? Huh? It's right there. Peter swore. And the footnote that I have on that word swore, it says this is a very strong word that can also be translated blaspheme. Anybody know anything about the Bible know that blasphemy is very bad. Some translation says he cursed, he cussed, said a bad word. This translation just says swore. We don't know what he said. However, he said something that wasn't too godly. 
Peter swore, and then he said, I am not his disciple. But one of the other servants to the high priest, a relative to the man whose ear Peter had cut off. That's a very interesting story. Rabbit trail number one. Peter, <laughs> I get on these a lot. Peter, and for those of you who don't know what a rabbit trail is, like you got a coon dog and he's trying to find a rabbit or he's trying to find a coon. I'm sorry, he's trying to find a coon up in a tree. Well, then he smells a rabbit, so he goes over here and chases the rabbit instead of the coon. That's why I call it a rabbit trail. So I'm over here for a minute, all right? We'll get back to that. So Peter, they're in the garden. They're coming to capture Jesus, right? And what happens is when they come to capture Jesus, Peter draws his sword, chops the ear off of one of the, the soldiers. The ear falls off. Yeah, the Bible is kind of interesting if you actually read it. So he, chop, he chops the ear off. His ear falls. And Jesus reaches over and tells Peter, he says, no, that's not how we're doing this. Picks the guy's ear up off the ground. The guy that come to pack, that capture Jesus. Picks the guy's ear up. I wish I could touch some of y'all. And places it back. I'll touch myself. Places it back on his ear. And heals the, the man. The same man that was coming to capture him, Jesus picks his ear up, throws it back on his head, and in an instant, his ear reattaches. The Bible, it has some interesting things in it if you just read it. This is a real story from the Bible. So this, so this other man that recognizes Peter is related to the guy that Peter had chopped his ear off. So... That guy looks at Peter and says, Wait, I know that I've seen you in the garden with Jesus. Then Peter denied Jesus a third time. And he said, No. And at that very moment, a rooster crowed nearby. Why is that significant? Because Jesus had prophesied this. Jesus had told Peter at the Last Supper, which we've come to know as the Passover meal, Another interesting story. Don't have time for. Passover meal they're having in the upper room. Jesus looks at Peter before all this happens. And he says, Peter, you're going to not deny me three times. Peter says, Lord, I would never deny you. I'll, I'll never forsake you. And I think Peter was genuine in that. But when the going. I better get your notebooks out. When the going got tough. Peter denied Jesus. How many times when the going gets tough do we... Jesus, I know you're there, man, but I'm just going to hang out over here for a while. I, I know you love me, but... Mm, I, don't, I don't know. And then we get around a certain group of friends that may be not Christians. Are we... Get on certain people's TikToks. Let me bring it down to the real level. And all of a sudden, you're relating to that. You may not physically be saying, I don't know Jesus. But your actions are. And I didn't come here to condemn you. I just come here to, to help you relate to a story. You know, the, not saying what you're doing is going to send you to hell. I'm just saying, we've all been in Peter's shoes and, and denied Jesus when the going gets tough. We've all been Peter. What was Jesus' response? Anybody know? One translation says that as soon as Peter denied Jesus the third time, I'm going to do it to you because I know you won't find it awkward. There, Jesus' eyes met Peter's signifying that means Peter knew the revelation come back to Peter's mind where Jesus said, you're going to deny me. Peter knew that he had done it and Jesus knew without saying a word. Jesus goes to the cross. He's crucified. And we all know that story. Jesus is crucified on the third day, raises again. I could teach on that all night. And, and what that gave you access to. 
Do you know what the resurrection of Jesus gave you access to? I'm not talking about just happy Easter. Let's get some Easter eggs out and color them. No, 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 no. There's some things you, you in this room, you have access to in your life because of the resurrection of Jesus. It's not some fairy tale story that happened 2,000 years ago that doesn't apply to you in this day. He did it so that He could give you some things of Himself. And those things are amazing. However, I'll teach on that another night again. So Peter knows that he's denied Jesus. Jesus knows that Peter's denied Him. Jesus goes to the cross, raised again on the third day. And then he starts appearing to people after his resurrection. We can get caught and say, oh, that's cool. Think about this. Jesus died. Dead. Gone. Three days. Raises back to life. And then he starts appearing to people. Walking through walls. Interesting fact that's in the Bible. Did you know that when Jesus raised from the dead. That thousands of people who were dead for years and years. Raised with him. <laughs> the power of Jesus' resurrection. Go back and study it. The power of his resurrection. Empty graves of dead people who had been dead for a long, long time. So think about this. You're living in that day. Grandpa George died. Been dead five years. God rest Grandpa George's soul. We love him. We miss him. This man named Jesus from Galilee goes to the cross, dies, and raises. And then all of a sudden, Grandpa George is alive again. It's there. It's a cool story. Some of y'all want to go home and read this thing now. Praise God, I did my job. Now, beyond all of that, Jesus starts appearing to people after his resurrection. Walking through walls, talking to them like I'm talking to you. And chronologically, Jesus has a meeting with Peter and his disciples. And he tells them, go and tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. We know that, that he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. However, what do they do? John 21. John 21, later, Jesus appeared once again to a group of his disciples by Lake Galilee. It had happened one day that Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, Jacob, John, and two other disciples. How many is that? Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, Jacob, John, and two more, seven. <laughs> seven of them were hanging out. Peter told them, I'm going fishing. Peter, bro. Bro, 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 bro. Bro. <laughs> Don't you think you're in a bad enough spot with Jesus? Don't you think you should do what he told you to do? Go hang out in that room until something happens in you that's powerful. Come on, bro. Bro. I just like saying that. My wife gets irritated. If she was here, she'd give me, she'd roll her eyes. Bro. You should just listen to Jesus. However, G I believe, personally, I have no way to prove this, but I believe Peter's still wrestling on the inside with what he had done. Denying Jesus. That he can't reconcile what he should be doing. It's about to be good. Peter can't reconcile what he should be doing with his actions. Some, some of you knew that you should be worshiping tonight. However, you couldn't reconcile worship because of some of the actions. 
sorry. Peter knew that he should listen to the Lord. However, because he knew what he had, because he knew what he had done, he could not reconcile his actions to the word that he knew he should be applying his self to. So he says to, to them, he says, I'm going fishing. I ain't going up there to that upper room. I'm going fishing. Peter was a fisherman before he met Jesus, if you don't know that. So he was really good. It was a family business. He knew how to fish. If he knew how to do anything, Peter knew how to fish. And they all replied, well, heck, we'll go with you. Heck, ain't in there. I just added that. <laughs> he said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and they fished all night. But just like if you go fishing with Logan, they caught nothing. <laughs> huh? You caught two today? It's cause I, I guess it was because I wasn't on the boat. Both times I've been fishing with Logan, we caught nothing. <laughs> so they fish all night. They catch nothing. Then at dawn, the sun's coming up. They've been up all night. Jesus was standing there on the shore. But the disciples didn't realize that it was him. He called out to them and said, Hey guys, bro. I added that. Did you catch any fish? Not a thing, they said. Jesus shouted to them, Throw your net over the other side. And you'll catch some. <laughs> I mean, if I was on the boat and I've been fishing all night, I know when I go fishing with Logan, I try both sides of the boat. I ain't just going to try the right side. If they ain't biting, I'm going to try over here. I'm sure they had tried this sometime during the night. I'm sure. So then comes a man saying, throw your net on the other side. I would be like, well, he done tried that. But that's not what they did. They did what he said. He said, heck, we'll try it one more time. So they throw their net on the other side again. And at that moment, they caught so many fish, they couldn't pull in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved. Anybody know who that is? John. John is the one writing this book. It's John chapter 21. So, in, so at, imagine I'm writing this, and I'm writing it, and I go, I, I could go, then Timothy told Peter. But John didn't do that. John said, the one whom Jesus loved. John described himself. He, he would only identify himself throughout the whole chapter of John that he wrote. The way he identified himself, his identification for himself was the one who Jesus loved. That's powerful. Do you see yourself as the one who Jesus loves to the degree that you're willing to not call yourself by your name, but just call yourself beloved? <laughs> Some deep stuff. So the one whom Jesus loved, which we know is John, he said to Peter, it's the Lord. How did John know that? Because of the miracle that had happened. Because they cast it on the other side, they listened to the whisper. And when they listened to the whisper, miracle happened. So John knew by walking with Jesus for those three and a half years, he knew who it was. That has to be Jesus. If that wasn't Jesus, that wouldn't have happened. So John knew that it was Jesus. He tells Peter, man, it's the Lord. It's Jesus. When Peter heard him say that. Now, remember where Peter's at internally. He's just denied Jesus. He didn't listen to the command that Jesus had told him. Go wait in the upper room. 
I, if it was me, I would be struggling on the inside and kind of wondering if my relationship was still intact with Jesus. However, Peter, when he hears it's the Lord, wraps his outer garment around him and dives into the lake, swimming to go to Jesus. I've heard it said like this. This is not my own revelation. But I've heard it taught like this at this point. What did, listen to this question. What did Peter know about the nature of Jesus that I don't? Peter have, has walked with him for three and a half years. He's seen how he handles people who are away from the Lord. And even though he himself has denied Jesus, turned his back on Jesus, and even blatantly refused to do what Jesus said, he still jumps out of the boat to swim to the shore. Because Peter knew something about the nature of Jesus and his goodness and his love and his mercy that maybe me and you don't know. How often have you ever, not even often, have you ever completely disobeyed God? Completely turned your back on God? Completely done something you know is wrong? Have you ever been in that spot and then went running to the feet of Jesus? No, not many of us. It took me 30 some years to learn how to do that and I still wrestle with it sometimes. What did Peter know about the nature, the goodness of Jesus that maybe me and you haven't experienced yet? That he would jump out of the boat to swim, to get in the presence of Jesus, knowing he had failed. It's good, good stuff. The other disciples brought the boat back to shore, dragging all the fish they had caught. They weren't that far from land, just about 100 meters. And when they got to shore, they noticed a charcoal fire with some roasted fish and bread. Then Jesus said, bring me some of the fish that you just caught. So Peter waited in the water and he helped pull the net to the shore. It was full of many large fish. Exactly 153 fish were in the net. 153 fish. That's a lot of fish. But even with that many, the net didn't tear, which is a miracle in itself. If you study out the weight of the fish, how many there was, the type of netting, it's a miracle that the, that the net didn't just rip. Come on, let's have some breakfast, Jesus said. What? This is Jesus, man. This is, oh, Holy Ghost, Jesus. Taking time after his resurrection to go sit by a campfire with charcoal with his boys. Can you even see Jesus in that way? If you can't, you may not know him as friend yet. And that's okay. There's grace for that tonight. Man, we're in some deep waters. Wow. He's friend. Should Jesus, you just raised from the dead. You raised all them people with you. Shouldn't you be out ministering or saving more people or... Doing some holy things in the temple. But you. Oh, come on. But you're coming to sit by a campfire with your boys. Jesus was intentional. Why was he there? Let's read on. Why was he there? Come on, boys. Let's have some breakfast. 
Man, I'd have loved to have been there. I'm going to have some breakfast with Jesus. <laughs> and I ain't waiting until I get there to do it. I'm going to do it here. Not one of the disciples needed to ask who it was. Because every one of them knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus came close to them. And he served them the bread and fish. Again, can you see him as that? If Jesus was in the room saying, hey, let's go have some breakfast. Wouldn't you be the one going, Lord, here's, here's the bread, here's the, here's the fish. But he said, no, 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 no. Sit down. Let me serve you. He's friend. He's brother. He's not just holy God living in a far distant land. He's your friend. And what else did he do? After they had had breakfast. Oh wait. Then Jesus came close to them, served them bread and fish. This was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. After they had breakfast, remember I asked the question, why did Jesus go hang out with his boys? What was so important that Jesus wanted to just go hang out? One, I believe he just wanted to be with his boys. Because he's Jesus, he's your friend. Secondly, this is why. After they had breakfast, Jesus said to Peter. Remember where Peter was at? Denied Jesus. Didn't obey his commands. He said to Peter, Simon, son of John. He calls him by his Reverted name. Now if I go through a name transformation. If I go from Bob to Jimmy. And Bob was not that good. But Jimmy was amazing. Because Jimmy was identified by Jesus the Christ. I ain't going to want you calling me Bob no more. Jesus starts playing with his psyche. And he says, Simon, <laughs> so much in this, there's so much in this. Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me more than the others? Cause him his reverted name because that's who Peter was acting like when he denied him. Peter was battling his flesh. And Jesus knew it. We all have that duplicity on the inside of us. We all battle the flesh desires of life. There's a Simon in all of us. Simon. Do you burn with love for me more than these? The, the footnote is the word for love used in this is a Greek word, huba. And it's taken from the root word that means to set on fire. This was the word Jesus would have used to ask Peter. Do you burn with love for me? Our love for Jesus must be passionate and it must kindle a holy flame in our hearts. See Song of Solomon 8, 6, and 7. This is what it says. Simon, do you burn with love for me? Peter, go back to Peter. Peter answers. I've never seen this till now. Peter answers. Simon couldn't answer the question. Because he was still acting as Simon. Peter answers. The spirit man, the new man of Peter, answers the question. Yes, Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Then take care of my lambs, Jesus said. Number one. Jesus repeated his question a second time. Simon. Oh, Lord, 
I'm about to dance all over this room. Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me? Number two. Peter answers again. <laughs> the vision between flesh and spirit. Peter answers again. Yes, my Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Then Jesus asked him again. Number three. Once for each time he denied him. Peter asked, John, Jesus asked him again. This time he says, Peter. Now that I've got you out of your fleshly mind and I've made you realize you were acting like Simon, but there's a Peter in you. You may have acted like Simon in those moments, but I don't see Simon, I see Peter. Because I know that deep down, that's still there. The third time Jesus goes, Peter, son of John, do you have great affection for me? Peter was saddened by being asked a third time. And he said, my Lord, you know everything. You know that I burn with love for you. Jesus replied, then feed my lambs. Why did Jesus go sit by a campfire with his boys after his resurrection? It was to make sure that Peter knew there was still a Peter in there. It was to make sure that he knew that Simon knew that Peter was still alive on the inside, burning with passion for Jesus. It was for Peter. And I believe he's doing the same thing tonight in this room. I believe that many of us may have just kind of fallen off in our relationship with God and we, have, we just don't have as much passion as we once did or maybe we've even denied even knowing Jesus or through our actions we've denied Him or through our actions we've just said no I, I, I'm not interested you know, right now I, I'm kind of mad at you I don't understand what everything's going on why would you send this to earth I don't, I, no I don't want nothing to do with you and then tonight He sends me in here to be a voice for Him to say to you, he just wants to sit down with his friends and reassure you, he understands what's going on internally. He understands the turmoil. He understands the questions. He understands why you denied him. He understands why your flesh just, just, just went haywire in this season. Why you may have done things you've never done before. Why, 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 why you kept doing this and you, you wanted to stop but you couldn't. And he understands. He understands you. He created you. But there's a Peter in you. Whew. The weight of that hits you, man. You may have acted like Simon during this season because your flesh got all out of whack and you had no spiritual guidance and, and everybody you looked to for help, they had no understanding of the spirit realm. That's why, let me make a statement. That's why when we go through things like we went through the last three months, it is important, it is key for you to stay connected to men and women of the kingdom. Because if you don't, there's no direction. And your flesh gets all out of whack. Some of these boys, man. Man, I can't. They just text me and they say, man, can we come hang out? Yes. Because my flesh is out of whack too. I needed your company as much as y'all needed mine. That's why these small groups are going to be so important. You've got to stay connected to leadership. In times of turmoil. Because everybody's flesh is all out of whack, man. We all acted like Simon at some point the last three months. We all did. Reverted back to old ways. Reverted back to old mindsets. And I come to tell you it's okay. 
He understands. He's your friend. He just wants to sit by a campfire and reassure you there's a Peter in there. Mighty God. Mighty God. There's a Peter in there. And it may be subtle. You may not can feel, you may not, you may not can answer, I burn with passion for you right now. But it's in you. It's still there. It may be covered. It may be hard to feel. Because what happens when your flesh gets out of whack, what happens is all of a sudden we start to be like a leper. Leprosy sets into our heart and we stop feeling. That's why alcohol, alcoholics become alcoholics. That's why druggies become druggies. It, 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 it's all explained in this. We just want to be numb because it hurts too bad to feel. But there's a man, and he's real. His name is Jesus, and he comes and he sits with you. Not as God to kick you in the head and say, what'd you do that for? He comes to sit with you as friend and reassure you there's a Peter in you. I say this a lot, but this may be the most crucial teaching I've ever done. There's a Peter in you. Jesus could have been anywhere. He should have been somewhere else. He's been raised from the dead. Why would you go hang out by a charcoal campfire, Jesus? You got things to do. But he said, I'm going to hang out with my boys for one reason. And that's because I want to make sure Peter knows. Peter, you acted like Simon. But I still call you Peter. There's a Peter in you. It's okay that your flesh got out of whack. It's okay that you didn't cling to. You didn't know. We've, none of us, this is uncharted territory. We didn't know what to do. Nobody, not even me. It's okay that your flesh got out of whack and you acted like Simon for a minute. But don't stay like Simon. Let this message tonight free you. You can't, listen to me, this is, there's weight to what I'm saying. Heavy weight. You can't just sit under teaching like this and not change. Because if you do, you'll disconnect. Because you'll hate my guts. It's just what happens. You either change while you sit under teaching like this, or you hit the door. I want you to change so that we can be in fellowship. I want you to go through metamorphosis. Just like a caterpillar to a butterfly. I want you to change. We're all evolving. Come on, Peter. There's a Peter in there. Stop seeing yourself as Simon. Stop seeing yourself identified. This is powerful. Stop seeing yourself identified by the things you did while you acted like Simon. Those things don't identify you. Moments in the flesh do not identify you unless you focus on them. However, moments in the presence of God can drastically identify you. And we're about to have one in just a few minutes. I really believe that. I really believe God has just set us up to, to really encounter Him tonight. I want to tell you, there's so much grace for you. You can go ahead and cut the lights down and get that, those last two songs prepared, whoever's doing that. <clears throat> where sin abounds, meaning where sin is really big, there's so much more grace 
That's what the Bible says, not, not my words. So whatever it is that you've walked through the past three months and, and you seem like you just can't get over it, and there's more grace for you to come out of that than there ever was for you to stay in it. There's more grace for you to come out of that than there ever was bondage to keep you in it. So it doesn't mean that you've had to go and do these awful, tremendous sins. Because I don't believe, even if you did that, there's so much grace for that. But I'm not saying every one of you in here has went and done all these awful things. No. For me, losing just a degree of passion for Him begins to hurt me. Think about where you were three months ago in your relationship. It doesn't have to be these enormous sins. It can be. There's still grace for that. There's still forgiveness for that. There's still a Peter in you. However, if that's not you, however, if that's not you, but you went from on fire to nothing, that's just a great of sin that you need to recover in this moment as if you were to go through something tremendously bad. Peter, do you burn with passion for me? I want to I speak to somebody by way of live stream tonight. You've watched some of this and it's just it's alive in you. Do you burn One who set you free. And if you don't, let's go recover it tonight. Don't wait. Let's recover it tonight. They're going to play a couple songs here. And I believe in these moments, you can stay in your seat, you can lay on your face, you can go to the back. I don't, I don't care however you want to worship. It's fine with me. Stand up. It doesn't matter. Nobody looking around. Nobody, you focus on you. Let him whisper some affirmation into you. Let him break some things off of you tonight. Regain that passion for him. There's a Peter in you. Come on. Let's worship him in these last two songs, okay? There's an army rising up. There's 
is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, Break every chain, break every chain. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I, I decree over you as she just keeps playing that. I decree over you that, that your friend, your friend, Jesus, he's here in the room taking those chains. Whatever it is that's, that's seemingly bound you during this break or during the last few months, whatever it is that's held you captive, I decree by way of Holy Spirit, Jesus, your friend, is sitting around a campfire with us tonight. And he's saying, I break those off of you. I decree a holy decree over you that says no more bondage, no more chains. No more will you be slave in your mind 
to the things that have caused you to see yourself anything other than the one whom Jesus loves. Those chains are falling. They're rattling and falling tonight. The chains that, of condemnation that says, why'd you do that? And God's never going to forgive you. Those chains are being broke and shattered in the presence of God. The chains that says, I'm unlovable. Nobody loves me. Surely God can't love me. Nobody else. No, 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 no. Those chains are shattering in the presence of God. You're not unlovable. He created you in His image. You're not ugly. You're not someone who just gets used and abused. You're valuable. You're as valuable as Peter was to him. You're so valuable that he gave me this message at the last minute because he knew that you would be in this room. He's not just going to sit by the campfire with Peter. He's coming in this room to sit with you. To make sure that you know those chains can't hold you anymore. To make sure that you know that time in your flesh, that's over. There's still a Peter in you. However, if you, if you like the bondage, you'll never come out of it. It's hard truth. If you like being bound, you'll never break free. However, if you want freedom tonight from whatever it is that may be binding you, there's freedom in the room. There's freedom in the presence of Jesus. Just drop it. Let go of it. Let it disintegrate in His presence. No longer will it plague you. No longer will it mess with your mind. No longer. His presence is enough. He's coming to sit with His friends to reassure you that He loves you. And even if you don't burn with passion for Him, He burns with enough passion for you to make this happen right now. He burns with passion for you. Chains falling 
break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Way maker, miracle worker, 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 way maker, miracle worker. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. We make a miracle work. Waymaker, miracle worker, waymaker, miracle worker, waymaker, miracle worker. I decree by way of live stream, this is going to hit you. This flow of the presence of God is coming into wherever you're watching from. And I decree that it's breaking things, chains that have bound you for years. Chains that may have held you captive for years. Mindsets that's held you captive for years. Things that you've been susceptible to. In this moment, the way maker, the miracle worker is coming to set you free. Your friend, the one who likes to sit by campfires, he's coming to set you free in a moment in the presence of God. And it's going to change you forever. Way maker. Miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Way make miracle work. Way make miracle work. Way make miracle work. Way make miracle work. Way I wasn't going to do this, but I'm just going to go for it. 
So, I we've all talked about transfiguration, and once you lay your chains down, and that's such a powerful moment. And we're having this moment where we break free of these chains, and we just sung, "I hear those chains falling," and I believe that I hear that I hear these chains are falling in our life and in His presence. But when you look beside you, you still see the chain on the ground, and you still see that, and it's still there, and it's still bugging you, and it's gonna bug you. But you have to, he sung Waymaker during that. And that was so powerful. And that's why I know this is of God. Because the way that you get from seeing those chains to them actually being beneath you is through the Waymaker. He's, you don't have to figure it out. He figures it out for you. He makes a way so that you don't have to look down and see those things every time you wake up in the morning. Every time you deal with these things. They will fall beneath you through the Waymaker. And as you see those chains and you're kind of figuring out who you are, those chains are heavy. You're not meant to carry that. So when you let go of that, it's like you're a new person. And you're going to go through this feeling and you're going to be like, who am I? No matter what you let go. I, I've been through these moments and I've let so many different things go. No matter what you let go, it's still, there's still a moment where you're like, who am I without this? And it's because so much weight has been lifted off of you. You're almost a new human. And as you lift that weight off of you, let me declare this over you. You're going to need a new identity so that you don't have to deal with that anymore. And it's beneath you. So I'm going to let this identify you the way it identified me. And whether it's right here in this moment or you need to take it and think about it. But this verse, it's Song of Songs 4-6. And this verse has identified me in moments when I felt so unidentified. And as you leave these things down, you're going to feel a little unidentified, and that's okay, because you're a whole new person right now. And those things are below you and beneath you, and you don't have to deal with that anymore. But as you start to figure out who you are, allow this to stick with you. It's Song of Songs 4-6, and it says, I've made up my mind until the darkness disappears and the dawn has fully come. In spite of shadows and fears, I will go to the mountaintop with you, the mountain of suffering love and the hill of burning incense. Yes, I will be your bride. So as you ask yourself, how do I see myself as the one who Jesus loves? How do I see myself as the beloved? And it all starts, I feel like it all starts with you sitting down and saying, yes, I will be your bride. Even though it looks uncertain, and I don't even know what that means yet, I accept that identity on my life. And when you accept that identity on your life, things start to shift and things start to change. And those chains go below you and beneath you. And you will start to look over and they won't be there anymore. Because you have your new identity. So whether it's right now or in a few weeks from now and you just feel unidentified, sit down and say, God, I will be your bride. I'll be your beloved. I don't know what that means yet and I'm not there yet. I'm still not there yet. I don't see myself completely as his beloved yet. But I'm on the pathway to doing that. And when you sit and you're like, okay, God, I say, yes, I'm your bride. I'm your beloved through everything you have for me. And you allow yourself to be identified as the one who Jesus loves. And you, you start to pick up that identity. You, be, you experience freedom in those situations. So when you're going through these things, just like all of us have, and you're uncertain and you're like, who am I now? Sit down and say, yes, God, I will be your bride through everything saying yes to being his beloved just means you say yes to him loving you even in your darkest hour that's all it means you allow him because it's your, it's your responsibility you have to allow him to love you in the middle of your mess and if you can do that then you're gaining traction on becoming coming what we call the beloved the, your identity becoming the one whom Jesus loves You've identified yourself as so many other things. Good athlete, right? Some of you cheerleaders, some of you basketball players, some of you soccer players. Some of you, You've identified yourself as so many other things. A good student, a good daughter. Fat, ugly, unlovable. You've identified yourself by so many other things. What if tonight, what if, just what if, just what if tonight you said, He loves me. 
not only does He love me, but that's who I am. It's not just this kid song, Jesus loves me. No, He really does. It's not cliche. He really does. In spite of all your mistakes, in spite of all the things you've done wrong, He sees it all, but He still loves you wildly, beyond your comprehension. He loves you so much that as you sleep, He counts the numbers of hair on your head. The Bible says the thoughts that He has just for you, how many thoughts He has just for you, outnumber the individual grains of sand on the earth. Think about the beaches, the the individual grains of sand. His thoughts for you, not for the church, for you, outnumbered those. He took time to take something of himself, out of himself, form it with his hands, with his words, and wrap flesh on it and call it you. You're not a mistake. You're not. It's impossible to be a mistake. It's impossible. Oh man, I feel a shift in this room. You listen to this father. You listen to this father. I'm seated at fatherhood in this room. Spiritual father. You listen to me. It's impossible for you to be a mistake. It's impossible for you to be a mistake. It's impossible. I don't care what your I don't care what your aunt uncle said. I, I don't care what the world said about you. It's not possible to be a lot. There was intentionality. He was intentional. He was intentional about creating you. Intentional about you being you. You look the way you do. You smile the way you do. Your eyes are the color they are because He created you. Because He loves you. And the things you're seeking after to make you feel solidified... Even if you achieve them, outside of being his beloved first, they'll taste wrong. Even if you achieve being TikTok famous, Facebook famous, a famous YouTuber, whatever it may be you're trying to achieve, an NFL player. Even if you achieve that outside of being his beloved first it will never feel right at the core of who you are you're his beloved he just loves you and you can't change it it's impossible for you to be a mistake that thing's swirling I can almost see the words I can almost see him in the spirit swirling in the atmosphere it's impossible for you to be a mistake. That, mind, that, that phrase is setting some of you free. For years you thought, I'm a mistake. They didn't want me. Nobody wants me. Everything I do is wrong. Listen to me. Your parents are just stressed out. They do not mean that. They don't mean it. They're just stressed out. They're hurting too. The people who have told you that, they're just hurting. It's impossible. Mighty God. I might write this on these walls. It's impossible for you to be a mistake. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. You have a calling. There's people that will never be reached without you. There's people waiting on you 
to see yourself right. There's people waiting on your life to bloom. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. You're the generation. You're the Elijah generation. You're the generation that begins to reform this thing. You're, you're the generation that helps us older people see things new so that we can see it pure. We need you. I need you. The world needs you. People need you. And it's impossible for you to be a mistake. You were handcrafted. Handcrafted. By the creator of the universe. Do you know that he made the world before he made you? He made the world for you. He didn't just say, I'll make creation, trees and birds, and, and then, oh yeah, I'll make humans. No, no. The whole intent of the world, the whole purpose he created, the globe, was for you to enjoy and rule and reign and fish and hunt and do things that are fun. He created this inhabitants we call the globe for you. You're not a mistake. You're everything to him. You're everything to him. They're going to go into a song. And this is how transformation works. We're just talking about the chains falling. <laughs> now we're going to sing the blessing. Because in one encounter with Jesus, you can go from bound to blessed. One encounter in his presence, you go from being bound to a blessed, beloved child of God. There's, there's lives in this room that testify to that. You can go from being so bound to so blessed in a moment. We're going to sing the blessing over you. This is who you are. This is what he wants for you.
Come on, this next part is our prayer for you. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he's for you he is 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 for you Lift our hands, just sing Amen for a minute. Father God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you that you care for us enough that you would remind us of the story of Peter. Tonight, as we get ready to go home, go back to what we're calling normal for now. Abba, I ask that you send angels. You send angels to encounter your children, to protect your children, to protect the, your Bible. The word, your word says that your angels protect the intimacy of the bride and the bridegroom. So I declare that your angels will protect the intimacy, the, the tenderness that we feel in this moment. And when we start to look at things we shouldn't, and when we start to say things we shouldn't, Lord, I'm asking that you prick our hearts and you remind us, no, no, let's stop acting like Simon. Let's, let's be Peter. Let's, let's, let's focus on Jesus. Give us grace to encounter you at home. Give us grace to dig into your word. And as we dig into your word, send your Holy Spirit to, to give us fresh revelation. Let us be bold when we're out and about this week. Let us be bold to talk to other people. Let us be bold to smile, to show love to people that we may even not know. And let us always remember you're our friend who just wants to sit around the fire and affirm us. And I decree these words to be written on the hearts of everyone listening. 
it's impossible for you to be a mistake. You were handcrafted. Write them on our hearts. Write them on the generations to come behind us. We love you and we thank you. We praise you. Amen. I love you guys. You're dismissed. Thank you for hanging in there. I'm sorry we're a little later than usual, but we get in flows like this. I don't want to end. Feel free to talk to your friends or grab a snack in the um, lounge back there. Come say hey to me, and I'll be connecting you with your small group leader this week at some point. Love you guys. See you.